All right, y'all. Uh, y'all know that over the well, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Uh, since we've began doing this, so we've been working our way through the faith statements uh, again. Uh, the two that we've settled on, and I'll, I want to. Uh, before long, we're going to go start doing some other things in the Heidelberg Confession and uh, the, or the Belgian Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and uh, some of the councils of Dort and things like that. But we'll have some small uh, church history stuff that goes on before that, just just to set the stage for it. But um, we have been working our way through the Westminster Confession and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Um, Today we're using the uh, Second London Baptist Confession. You'll remember, if you'll remember, these two confessional statements are, are mirrors of one another in in many ways. The further along we get, we have to transition away from the Westminster Confession because of uh, the language on baptism and uh, uh, things like that. And then, you know, we, we believe in ordinances where we are baptized and we participate in the Lord's Supper. Uh, they are, they believe more in a, or well, infant baptism and things like that. We believe in a believer's baptism. So, uh, we, we, we begin to transition away from that. Uh, confessional statement, we're going to lean more on the Second London Baptist Confession. Uh, and again, the uh, Southern Baptist faith and message uh, is, uh, is a summary at best of these confessional statements that even our own. Uh, confessional statement here at church uh, uh, is, is also uh, a smaller version, a summary of these. So, uh, you know, these documents are very uh, important in our uh, in our belief, right? Uh, this, this is the particular Baptist of London. Um, we are, as Southern Baptists, we were the particular Baptist of the South. So, um, we, uh, we stand on the shoulders of 2,000 years of church fathers and Christian theology, and you've got a Reformation tucked in there and all that stuff, right? So just prior to this, we, we studied on perseverance of the saints, but today we're going to take a look at the assurance of grace and assurance of salvation. Has anybody ever struggled with assurance? No? Am I the only one? Huh? Nobody else has struggled with assurance. You know that you're saved. You never, you never struggled with it at all. Well, there's always doubt. There's good. That's good. Uh, but no, I've, uh, I have also uh, struggled with uh, the assurance of grace. A lot of times, I find that uh, my struggle is because uh, of my behavior. I've not uh, been studying the scriptures or in prayer or things like that, and then because of that, uh, the doubt comes and. It's hard to re be reminded that you're a child of, of God if you're not talking to God, right? Not studying His Word, things like that. But uh, nonetheless, it is. There are those that should struggle that don't struggle, right? Um, we know that. Uh, we also know from the Scriptures there will be those that have a confession that they don't possess, right? Um, that there'll be some some different soils out there that will not produce fruit and uh, they, they will believe they'll save. There'll be those that stand before God and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? And he'll say, depart from me, workers of lawlessness. I never knew. So there will be those. And so this is something that we must take serious in our life, right? It's the assurance of salvation. The assurance of grace and of salvation. So, just like um, every other time, we're going to read the statement, the confessional statement, and then we will uh, go back and start uh, to take it apart and then look at the Scripture verses that support the belief, right? Again, we start out with the Bible is infallible and inerrant, right? The Bible is the source of our truth. When we make the statement, we have to provide proof for it, right? All right, so... Let's read the Assurance of Grace and Salvation, the confessional statement, which should be the first page, front and back, that you have, right? And then you have the Scripture references for that. All right. 18. 
assurance of grace and salvation, temporary believers and other unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. But their hope will perish. Yet those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love Him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before Him, may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. They may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. Point two. This certainly is not merely an inconclusive or likely persuasion based on fallible hope. It is an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. It is also built on the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit about which promises are made. It is further based on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption witnessing with our spirits that we are children of God. As a fruit of this assurance, our, our hearts are kept both humble and holy. And then the Westminster Confession of Faith adds, which spirit is the earnest of our inheritance whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption? Point three. This infallible assurance is not such an essential part of the faith that is always fully experienced alongside of faith, but true believers may wait a long time and struggle with many difficulties before obtaining it. Yet, with the enabling of the Spirit to know the things freely given to them by God, they may attain this assurance using ordinary means appropriately without any extraordinary revelation. Therefore, it is the duty of all to be as diligent as possible to make their calling and election sure. In this way, their hearts may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God, and in the strength and cheerfulness of the duties of obedience. These effects are the natural fruits of this assurance. Thus, it does not all, excuse me, thus, it does not at all encourage believers to be negligent. True believe, point four, true believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. Not salvation, but the assurance of it. This may happen because they neglect to persevere, excuse me, to preserve it, or fall into some specific sin that wounds their conscience and grieves the spirit. It may have happened through some unexpected or forceful temptation or when God withdraws the light of his face and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet, they are never completely lacking the seed of God in the life of faith, uh, uh, love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart or conscience concerning their duty. Out of these graces, through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may be the proper time, may be in the proper time, revived. In the meantime, they are kept from utter despair through them. All right. Any questions? You got it, right? All right, so let's look at the top here. And again, I just want to reiterate, I think there was some confusion last time. We have the faith statement and then the scripture references, right? So you're going to use them alongside of one another. All right, <clears throat> so point one, this is temporary believers and other unregenerate people. Again, temporary believers, right? Remember from the parable of the soils, you've got the people that, or the, the soil, remember we're represented by the soil, our hearts, right? The, the, you have the stony ground where it comes up, and for a while it looks like they're saved, and then the heat of persecution comes, and they wither away because they have no root. Remember that? All right. That's a temporary believer. A uh, temporary believer. They're, they're believers only for a little while. And other unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. All right. Uh, that happens from time to time. Job 8, 13 through 14. So are the paths of all who forget God. And again, to forget God means at one point you knew him, right? Or at least 
You was made aware of him, right? You were enlightened at some point. Um, you heard, uh, you heard about God. You learned about God, uh, but it wasn't didn't necessarily take the heart, right? And the hope of the hypocrite shall perish, whose confidence shall be cut off, and whose fruit, excuse me, and whose trust is the spider's web. It's weak, right? All right. So again, there's true temporary believers and unregenerate people may deceive themselves in vain with false hopes and fleshly presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. We know those folks, right? We know those people. I mean, there's so many times that uh, we've been out witnessing and and, and uh, even in church you have people that just fall out of church attendance. They fall out of, and then come to find out they're acting like they never knew God, right? They just forget. Um, they are temporary believers. Um, this is one of the saddest things, right? And in my estimation, that would probably be the worst life. You know, you just to be somebody that knows God is real, knows He exists, and yet rejects God, right? After a while. Because you know they're miserable, right? That's got to be the most miserable existence. It's to know that, to know that you, you just don't know it, Right? Micah 3.11 Her heads judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for pay. And her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. So they do all these things for money. They do it for pay. They do it for bribes. They don't do it because they love the Lord. And yet, they do all these things and they still have this false presumption that God has favor with them. You see that? How often do we see that? And well, let me let me say it like this. I have uh, there is even within our Southern Baptist Convention, um, not everybody believes in in the. Uh, uh, election, predestination, all that kind of stuff. What we would call reformed theology, right? You know, we believe in those things. We we stand by them. We uh, we love the doctrine of election and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there are those that don't. And you know, that's their prerogative. Um, as long as you're not just insane free will and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, whatever. Okay. No harm, no foul. Right? You can be a uh, what a semi-Augustinian if you want, right? The problem is the uh, the people in the Southern Baptist Convention, the laity, are uh, in large part very, very Armenian. They are very, very free will, almost semi-Pelagian. And there's a lot of preachers that will look at me and say, hey, Pastor Shane, I'm going to tell you something. I don't want you to tell anybody. But I'm a Calvinist too. And uh, But don't say nothing. You know, they're worried about the pay. Either it's true or it's not true, right? Either this is what you believe or it's not. Are you doing this for pay? Are you doing this for a bribe? Are you prophesying for money? You see what I'm saying? And I just lose, and they don't know it, I, but I lose all respect for them, all they, they, they've lost it with me. Because here we are, you agree with me, you agree, you've read the church history, and, and, and that's the thing about the Southern Baptist Convention. Historically, we are Calvinist. All right? Whether we like it or not, whether um, my Baptist preacher brethren like to admit it or, or not, we are. Uh, you, you can't believe in perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved, and not be somewhat Calvinist, right? Uh, that's what's left over from from uh, our old Calvinism. And, you know, all that stuff got messed up at the, at the when liberalism tried to take over and, and everything, and did for a season. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, 
because of their silence, because they would rather have a paycheck, the pendulum has swung way outside of where it's supposed to be. Um, we are not Armenian in our theology at, at all. Uh, you can read this, the, the faith statements, the documents, um, the confessional statements, whether it be the New Hampshire Confession, um, um, Southern Baptist Confession of Faith, uh, the Abstract of Principles, all of these are Calvinist documents uh, uh, in large part to some degree. Um, are they, they, they mirror these, these documents here, the Westminster Confession and the Second, Second, Baptist, uh, uh, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. So, um, and, and, and I don't mean to sound like all the people who, who don't take a stand are, are not saved. But it scares me for them, right? Because the only reason they don't stand is because they don't want to get fired, right? And the reason they don't want to get fired is because you can go to a small church. You can do the option that I've taken and find the only church in Wilson County that, that, uh, that, that preaches these things and stands on them with, without fear or favor. And you would get a Sunday school class. Instead of a big booming church, right? I mean, really. Uh, so they're going to have to give an account for that, right? And it scares me for them because they may be deceived, uh, and and they have falsely presumptions that they have God's favor and salvation. Uh, they just refuse to stand. If you if you're doing it for money, then you need to go somewhere else, right? You need to do something else. Um, I don't know if I should have chased that rabbit or not, but we did, right? Deuteronomy 29, 19. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses his, himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the doc dictates of my heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. Uh, and again, same thing here. It's, it's this idea that the promises of God are applied to me even though I, I don't exhibit a new life, right? That's the thing about the Christian. That's the thing about the believer. That's the thing about the person who's been regenerate, right? Is you have the, the life of Christ. You have a, a, a new life. It's to be born again, right? It's the change of nature, right? We understand that. And one thing that I, I will say, because we're fixing to start looking at it quite a bit, it, the Gospel of John is, is a book on how to be saved, right? You, you read the Gospel of John, it's the new birth, right? It's, it's the new birth, being a new creation, etc. Right? That, that, it is a work of God. John's epistle, 1 John, is to know that you know you're saved. Right? That word not a know and is mentioned 40 times in 1 John. If you want to know, if you want to be assured of your salvation, read 1 John. Study 1 John. And we're going to quote 1 John several times, but that's just something, little little nugget you can take. Take your little color and pencil. And uh, uh, we're Tennessee fans, right? Do no in orange, right? Just and see how many times that, that, that word is mentioned. And you... That's how you develop your themes. That's how you develop a, a systematic theology in, in Scripture. To know that you know. You read 1 John. Okay, so uh, John 8, 41. You do the deeds of your father. Of course, you know that. He's talking to the, to the, uh, to the Judaizers or the, or the, the, the Jews there, the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious zealots of the day. He's talking to them and he's telling them they know they do the deeds of their father. So it's your practice. What do you do? What do you do? Uh, do you obey God, His commandments, or do you obey the commandments of men? Uh, again, back to our confessional statement. It says, but their hope will perish. There's coming a day when their hope will perish. Again, we mentioned this earlier, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, talking about the judgment day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? 
He says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Again, a lot of these things, a lot of these verses, the Arminian, those that are believers in free will, will tell you that these verses point to the uh, to being able to lose your salvation. Right? That, that you're saved by your works. We're not saved by our works. But our works do identify who we are. Right? The, unru- the unregenerate person practices lawlessness. The regenerate person practices righteousness. Now, we can still fall into sin, and we do from time to time, and that causes our doubt. But the person who practices lawlessness is a person who is unregenerate. And there, if one day, their false hope their fleshly presumptions and their false hopes will perish at judgment. Yet those who truly believe, back to our confessional statement, right? Yet those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love Him sincerely, love Him with their whole heart, right? So, we love, each, we love God with, with our heart, sincerely. We're true believers, Endeavoring to walk in all good conscience, conscience before Him may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. Again, here we go. First John. First John. Now by this we know. You can underline that there. You can highlight it. Now by this we know that we know Him. If we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. That's one indication there. One of the many ways that we know, and again, uh, these you don't get to pick the ones you want, right? And throw away the rest. This is an exhaustive list, right? This is it all has to apply. Uh, we don't get to keep some obedience and then throw away love of the brethren, right? First John 3.14 We know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. What's it talking about brother? It's not talking about your, your neighbor next door, is it? It's talking about your fellow Christians. Right? That's who your brothers and sisters in Christ are. All one of the one of the one of the main things that I uh, run into quite a bit, uh, probably more than somebody who's not living right for God and thinks he's saved because he made a confessional statement when he was in VBS or something like that. But one thing that um, I run into more than all of those is. Somebody who will say to me, you don't have to go to the church to be saved. You don't have to go to church to be saved. Because, you know, ultimately that's how I get the conversation started. You know, what church do you go to, right? Oh, you're not going to church. And then I'll talk to them about that. And then ultimately the the, the pastor in me has to admonish the so-called believer to, to begin attending church and encourage that. And uh, ultimately... I get this a lot. Uh, well, you don't have to go to church to be saved. And that's true. There's nothing salvific about coming through the church doors. Then nothing miraculous happened when you crossed the threshold of the church door, did it? But it's an indication because you don't love the brother. All men will know that you believe in me because why? You love one another. If, if, if a person does not go to church and they have no desire to go to church, and they've fallen out of, of, of church service, they have no desire to be with the brethren, they have no, no desire to sing the songs of Zion with the people of God, they have no desire to go to worship uh, collectively, and, and they, don't, they don't want any of that. 
that's an indication that they don't know Christ. Because the, 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 the Christian loves the fellowship, the koinonia, the fellowship of the redeemed. It's just the way it is. That's just something He's put into our hearts, right? We love the fellowship. Now, yeah, we'll get lazy. We'll lay out here and there. And our attendance will suffer. But for the most part, we love the fellowship. Right? You're our friends. You're, you're, you're our brothers and sisters. Crystal and I, you know, our kids. Our kids' friends. Our church. Outside of a couple of, of uh, family members and things like that that we remain close with. It's church friends. Shane, I think during COVID was a good time to realize whether or not you really wanted to be with the church. Oh, yeah. That was hard mm-hmm. to get out of church. Yeah. You just don't, yeah, we just didn't, it's not the same, right? right? It's not the same when we don't have fellowship with the body. I mean, As many times as I've been run out of a church, fired, and I've never been really fired, but ultimately that's what it was, right? It never came to that because I just I knew what was going to happen, so I just left. But as many times, as many conversations as I've had with deacons, women, that just flat out hated me, I still have never lost the love for the brethren. I love my Christian brothers and sisters. And I love them. Even though they they rejected the Bible, they rejected the Word of God, I still love them. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, I got mad at first, and I could have killed them a couple times. But uh, that was my flesh. But now, even now, I still love the brethren. One of the fellows that that uh, was partly responsible for me leaving, the, one of the head deacons at the last church, um, he, he found out that a couple of folks were lying to him and things like that. And He was getting old anyway. Now he's really old. And uh, he's suffering from health and things like that. And He asked that I come see him when he was in the hospital last time because he wanted to you know, apologize and all that. And... and Worked out great. And he called me friend. He said, thank you, friend. And, uh, and you know, you got to love the brethren. You've got to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the family of God. We're going to be together forever. Forever. And that just right there, it's just, uh, we might get through the first point, right? <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, this is, this is the evidence of the faith. This is the evidence. Do you love the brethren? Do you love the fellowship of the, the redeemed? Do you love to sing? Man, it just... Just to sing the hymns and the songs and greet the brethren. I love you. Right? We love each other. And uh, that's... That's evidence of the faith. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. You're still not saved. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. My little children, let us love in word let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and, 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 and shall assure our hearts before Him. We know that because it's not just in word and tongue, but it's also in deed and in truth. Right? First John 3.21 Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. In verse 24, the same chapter. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. That's a a theme throughout John as well. Keeping the commandments. Remember, John is the disciple with whom Jesus loved. I would say 
I would just be willing to bet that obedience and keeping the commandments was something John did. Um, you know, he was the, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So keeping the commandments is how we know. That assures us of our salvation, right? That's how we know that we, that we are in him. You want to be sure of your salvation? We keep the commandments. You want to know that you know? Does your life reflect his commandments? Or are you living in lawlessness? If you're living in lawlessness, I would say that your confession didn't go as far as the lights, right? 1 John 5.13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And, and for 1 John 5.13, if you want to go to your Bibles and kind of bracket that in, this is the, this is the whole theme of the, of, of the entire book of John. Uh, 1 John 5, verse 13, that is, that is the, the whole kit caboodle right there. That's, that's, that's the centerpiece of the book. 1 John 5, verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the, in the name of the Son of God, that you, that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So everything that John has written, he's written, 1 John, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You struggle with your salvation? Go to 1 John and see if your life mirrors what he says. And if not, you should call upon the name of God. Right? All right. Let's keep let's keep reading. We'll get through the first point, and then we'll then we'll go on go on back. Uh, and we do this that they may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. All right. Because of this, you rejoice. Romans chapter five, verse two says, "Through whom also we have access by faith into His grace in which we stand." And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So after we've read, a, you know, studied this particular section here, we're, we're assured of our salvation, then we get to rejoice in that, right? Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what we get to do. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Again, it's that love. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts. So, uh, any comments on that? Any questions? So, we do know that there are those who are temporary believers and unregenerate people that will be in our lives. Those are the tares among the wheat. They, they're there. Right? Makes you kind of sad when you look across the, the congregation, right? And you see brothers and sisters that some of them won't be there because they've deceived themselves. They have false presumptions, flesh, uh, fleshly presumption, false hopes. And their hope will one day perish. Those that truly believe in God with a sincere heart, they walk in all good conscience before Him. Again, we're not, we've not reached a state of sinless perfection. We can't do that. We're still going to battle against the flesh and lose the battle at times. But we have this walk that is in all good conscience before Him. We are assured in this life of a state of grace. Because of what the Bible says, right? That's something else that we, we need to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of times we, uh, we doubt our salvation because we don't just believe what the Bible says, right? The Bible, if this is your life, if, if what the Bible says and the keeping of the commandments, the love of the brethren, those things that John talks about, if that is your life, then... Then, uh, then you're saved, and you get to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, right? Any questions? Yeah, we'll never make it through it, so we're just gonna 
stop here and uh, we'll go to point two of this next week. All right? All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for the assurance of salvation. Uh, we thank you for your Bible. Lord, your Bible um, guides us. We have your infallible word to direct our paths. Every doubt that we may have can be corrected through the scriptures. Um, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, we study to show ourselves approved. We, we are constantly going back and looking at our lives to, to make sure we're in the faith. And Lord, you've assured us through your scripture that there's coming a day when cancer will not be mentioned, when malignancy and terminal will be a thing of the past and that uh, there's coming a day when we will this corruptible body will put on incorruption this mortal body will put on immortality and we will be forever with you to praise you with each other and Lord we, we thank you for that we thank you for this love of the brethren that you've given us love of, of your fellow sons and daughters Lord we, we thank you for that uh, Lord, we just pray again that your name be glorified in us. And we pray for John as he preaches this morning, that uh, he would also bring glory to your name through his preaching. And again, thank you so much in Christ's name. Amen.